Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jerry Swiggers. I'm from the University of Wollongong, but I'm going to be talking about our spin-off company, Hisata, that we started about three years ago, um, and tell you a little bit about our um, water, industrial water electrolysis system that we developed, which is bubble-free. Um, the technology is all about renewable hydrogen, or green hydrogen, uh, that is, um, hydrogen that's produced from water using a device called an electrolyzer. And the electrolyzer is powered by renewable electricity. Uh, so green hydrogen is a renewable fuel. Uh, it's a very energy dense material, very energy dense fuel. It contains 33.3 to 39.4 kilowatt hours uh, of usable energy in one kilogram. And if you compare, compare that to, for example, petrol or diesel, which contains only 12 to 14 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Uh, it's higher, it's also much higher than, for example, lithium ion batteries or any battery, which only contains around 0.265 kilowatt hours per kilogram. And so it is a way of storing renewable energy in a form that you can use as a fuel somewhere else. In fact, it offers the only viable way to decarbonize what are called the hard to abate sectors, the economic sectors, uh, of our economy that are hard to obey, things like shipping, aviation, heavy transport, chemicals. So if you think about a large passenger aircraft flying between continents, batteries, uh, they just cannot be powered by batteries, but they can be powered by hydrogen. And so you can take your renewable energy, store it in the hydrogen, and then use it for things like that. So those uh, hard to obey sectors produce about 30% of global CO2 emissions. And so if we can get green hydrogen to be used widely, then that's a huge portion of global CO2 that can be uh, taken out of the equation. And in fact, there's a lot of work being done on green hydrogen by many people around the world, many organizations. And generally, it's expected that green hydrogen is going to form about 20% of the world's energy supply by 2050. And that trend, that translates to absolutely huge um, you know, uh, um, opportunity to reduce global CO2 emissions, but also a huge commercial opportunity. So what are electrolyzers? I won't go through it, there's a lot behind it, but they are essentially devices that produce hydrogen from water using electricity. They've been around for about 200 years, and they have been used for probably over 100 years commercially, but they, they're not very, very efficient. So they've got two components. I won't go into it in detail, but there's what's called a cell stack, which is a series of electrochemical cells stacked together. And they're the things that actually produce the hydrogen. And then you have an engineering system around that called the balancer plant, which maintains it and monitors it. So where we came in is we developed a new cell architecture for these cells and I won't go through all of this but um, on the left here we're just showing the evolution of, of water electrolysis cell architecture that's sort of a classical version you've got two electrodes immersed in water and you've got uh, and, and when you put an electric current through them they produce hydrogen and oxygen typically in the form of gas bubbles and then they have a thing called a separator between them to keep those bubbles separate because if you mix hydrogen and oxygen together uh, in any appreciable quantities, then it becomes an explosive mixture. Hydrogen and oxygen is actually rocket fuel. It's <laughs> what they use to make, uh, send rockets to the moon. So this separator is very important to keep the two separate. Um, and the major developments along the way, back in the 1960s actually, that started being used in the 70s, people put the electrodes tied up against the separator called a zero gap cell to reduce the electrical resistance. And then more recently, people developed uh, what are called asymmetric cells, where the one chamber is left empty of liquid, so it's not flooded and it produces gas directly. And what we then came up with was a new technology where you let both chambers empty, but you still needed some way to supply liquid um, to the electrodes. And we did that by putting a reservoir at the bottom and using a separator that had a strong <coughs> capillary effect that drew the liquid up and uh, draws it up very rapidly. And uh, so it, 
that capillary induced flow rate actually facilitates a definite operation. Uh, and the other big advantage of this system is that you get bubble free gas generation. So at the electrodes, you have a direct conversion of liquid into the gases without forming any bubbles. You can see all these others have bubbles, and bubbles are a big hassle. Uh, they're expensive to handle and difficult to handle. This avoids all of those. Now, where ANFF came in was that we had to develop a whole lot of prototypes uh, to, to uh, you know, optimize the cell, which we did at the University of Wollongong. This was one of our prototypes. I think this was like prototype number five or so, uh, where we actually proved the technology and, and demonstrated. But there were others that ANFF helped us uh, as well. Um, and this is uh, sort of the proof of the pudding in many ways. This is what's called a polarization curve. So every electrolyzer cell has a polarization curve. And we plotted the best commercial cells. Yeah, there are two different types of electrolyzers. One is called an alkaline electrolyzer, and one's called a pen electrolyzer. And we plotted their polarization curves here, yeah, and we compared it to our one. And really, this, what this is showing is that on this axis, the amount of voltage you have to apply, that tells you the energy that you're putting in. And then the current density down here tells you the hydrogen output. So the name of the game here is to get this curve as low as possible, so you can produce as much hydrogen at as little energy as possible. And you can see we have a significant improvement on all the commercial versions out there. Uh, and that is mainly because we've been able to manipulate what's called the onset potential, which shifts the whole curve down. That, uh, we do that through the bubble-free aspect of our system. The long and the short of it is that a typical current density of an alkaline commercial electrolyzer, which is about 0.5 amps per square centimeters, uh, we can produce uh, hydrogen at 98% efficiency, uh, consuming around 40.4 kilowatt hours per kilogram. And when you add in the, um, the energy consumption of the balance of plant, the total system consumes around 41.5 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. That is actually better than the efficiency target for the year 2050 that was set by the International Renewable Energy Agency for electrolyzers. Uh, and we're doing that 30 years in advance of that target. The best state-of-the-art commercial electrolysis cells today and, and systems require 50 to 52 kilowatt hours. So significant improvement in energy efficiency. You just need much less renewable electricity to produce your hydrogen. And why is that important? Because 80 to 90% of the cost of making green hydrogen is the cost of the renewable electricity use. It's what's called OPEX, or uh, operating expenditure. The other 10 to 20% is the cost of the equipment called CapEx. That's relatively less important but it's easier to get that cheaper than to get the energy efficiency down. And so, in fact, capillary fed electrolyzers currently offer the lowest cost of green hydrogen at the moment, and we're expecting to be making it for less than $2 a kilogram, uh, hopefully much less than that by 2030. Uh, and there's been just a tremendous demand for this technology. Um, the, uh, the company we set up, Hisata, uh, it's about three years old. It's already got $5 billion in orders, which is just astonishing. Uh, and there's probably another $20 billion in negotiation. So, um, yeah, we're hoping we can really make a dent in world, uh, you know, in decarbonizing the world going forward. So, uh, so I'll stop there. These are the people who supported us, uh, and I thank all of them. And these are the people down here, my students and colleagues at the University of Wollongong who worked with me uh, to develop this technology. And they really did the work. I just get to talk about it. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much, George. Now, have you any questions? The layer? The layer. Yeah, we don't have a selective layer. It's a very different concept. Essentially, or maybe let me go back and uh, show you um, how this works. So um, what we've got is uh, 
the electrodes are tied up against the uh, separator. The separator is drawing liquid in by a capillary action, and then the separate, then the electrodes are being tuned to draw liquid out of that separator, but draw just enough out to get fully <coughs> wetted, but not over wetted. So. Um, what we want and what we were aiming to do and what this system does achieve is that those electrodes get wetted with a very thin layer of liquid. And if that is thin enough, then as you produce, as the electrodes produce gas, it dissolves in the liquid and migrates through and leaves. And so then you, have, you avoid bubbles. And uh, we have various ways of proving that there are no bubbles in the system. So it's kind of different to conventional systems. So if you had something else than hydrogen and oxygen, the contaminants in water, is the problem? Uh, no, we, comp we obviously control exactly what goes in there. So you can see we have uh, the water down here is uh, deionized water. So it's lab grade type deionized water. And the only reason for that is uh, because if you don't, then you will start building up contaminants if you use tap water or something then you will start using, uh, building up contaminants in there, so we deionize it to remove that. And then we also include uh, a strong alkaline um, substance called potassium hydroxide, the KOH, and that is just to make the system uh, strongly alkaline. Uh, and it just stays there, it doesn't do anything, it doesn't get changed, or all it does is conduct electricity between the two electrodes. There are various things you can, so the hydrogen obviously goes to your customer and they can use it for, you know, whatever they want to use it for, uh, for making chemicals, etc. The oxygen, there are various options for us, so it really depends on the customer. Some customers can use it, so steel plants, for instance, can use the oxygen to run their blast furnaces. Other customers have no use for it and then it's just venting. So you effectively are venting the oxygen. 